Welcome back to another GTA and Coaches Corner where we answer your triathlon questions for you. This week we are answering, <laughs> wait for it, what actually happens in zone two? Oh, another zone two question. <laughs> also another 80-20 question. How does 80-20 work? Yeah. Should I swim and bike in a run race taper week? And another zone two question. Can 180 beats per minute really be my zone two? And finally, help, I have shin splints. Oh, right. On to the first one from Altiste or Altist1. Um, does 8020 training fit into an overall tra triathlon training program? If on a weekly basis my runs include speed work and tempo runs, my swims include threshold and speed work, and on the bike I'm doing overgearing hills, sweet spot for example, then a relatively lower percentage of my training will be easy, particularly in the peak training weeks before a race. I don't think the uh, think training at a full 80% easy workouts would get me to the fitness level to perform well on race day. Okay, we've had this question quite a lot because 80-20 is a bit of a buzzword and the short answer is that 80-20 doesn't fit into your triathlon mm. training, really. Okay, 80-20 is a kind of rule of thumb to prevent you doing too much high intensity work and not enough aerobic work because triathlon is aerobic and you do need to do that aerobic work. Um, but that assumes that you've got an infinite amount of time to train and therefore you are going, you're only going to fit in so much uh, at high intensity and therefore the rest should be low intensity so 80 percent low intensity 20 percent high intensity however in practice when you are very limited in the amount of time you have and you actually have long periods in between sessions where you are doing everything else in your life like working and looking after kids and everything else you actually have more time to recover, less time to do the high intensity stuff. And as long as you're recovered from that high intensity, you can do more high intensity. There are a few caveats to this though. Triathlon is still aerobic. You need to do the aerobic training. You can't forego the aerobic training entirely and do all of your work in zone four because that's gonna leave you not very well prepared for your triathlon. But if you have done a good base of zone two training and you have a good aerobic base and you're getting the aerobic training in, you don't then need to make sure that four fifths out of all your training for the week is still aerobic. You can do some high intensity stuff as long as you're recovered from the last high intensity session before you do the next high intensity session, then you can do more than 20% of your training at a higher intensity. But just don't forego that aerobic training. The aerobic mm. training is important. It is an aerobic sport. Yeah, it's interesting that this 80-20 method has kind of come from a pro level racing and actually yeah. I think it became popular from uh, cross-country skiing that was when it really kind of came to the forefront and in the media uh, a lot of the started to do research into the training that all these top cross-country skiers are doing they realized actually 80% if not more at times was easy but they are training 20 30 hours a week some at points not maybe the limited seven to 12 hours a week that a lot of you may be doing and as I say two yeah. swims two bikes two runs doesn't really leave much opportunity to start doing that so yeah 20 percent of 30 hour weeks <laughs> is still a lot of high intensity work so yeah just bear that in mind it doesn't necessarily work for everyone uh marcus willis marcus wills asks i am just entering the final taper week before london marathon Ooh, uh, a bit late for that one i hope it went well yeah anyway as a triathlete should i still incorporate bike and swim sessions into the taper week or just concentrate on those final few runs and make sure I'm prepared for the marathon. Okay, relevant question. Obviously, the London Marathon already been and gone. I hope it, it went well for Marcus. Uh, but we'll answer it anyway because lots of triathletes run marathons or standalone yeah. runs and they want to, this question answered. Um, the best thing I find is to still do one to two swims and bikes in taper week. Uh, because your body doesn't want to completely shut down, it'll help you keep you loose, it'll help keep you moving, and it helps keep that little bit of aerobic fitness there. There's very little impact, so there's very little chance of it affecting your run race at the end of the week. Um, just bear in mind that you do need to recover from it, so don't go do <laughs> massively long or massively high intensity sessions. But keeping the body moving in taper week is actually really important. And if you're a swimmer and a cyclist, then doing swimming, swimming and cycling is a very good way to keep your body moving without any of the impact of running. Um, if you're just a runner and you're watching this and you don't do swimming and cycling, don't start <laughs> swimming or cycling in your taper week for your run uh, because there is a kind of 
curve where you've got to get used to swimming and cycling before it doesn't hurt you. As you say, if, if it's a running race that you're um, gearing up to, then actually swimming and biking is a fantastic means to kind of keeping that aerobic fitness going, the blood blood pumping, uh, because there is no impact or very little impact from it. So it's actually really good for that. Um, yeah, just bear in mind. In fact, it's also good even for a triathlon taper. Yes. So if you're traping for a triathlon, you don't need to not swim and bike in race week. Just bring the intensity way down and the duration, but keep your body moving all the way up to race day so that you are loose and feeling good for race day. You don't have to completely cut out all three sports. So yeah. swim and bike in any taper for a triathlon or a run. All right. Uh, this is an interesting this next one. Okay. Um, <laughs> Yannick, uh, 1D. Um, I'm training for my first full Ironman coming from bodybuilding background. Quite the transition, yeah, good going. Um, and um, one quite long, uh, and I have one quite long plus two hour zone two run per week. As I don't want to look at my watch a lot, I rely on heart rate or pace too much because because being confronted with how slow I am for straight speed. I prefer just running at a pace that allows me to breathe through my nose. However, I recently tested myself a little and concluded that I can still do this with a heart rate of 180 beats per minute. Oh, yeah. Um, I was able to stick to the same pace for more than 90 minutes like this. Is 180 beats per minute too high to still be aerobic slash zone two? Or is my heart rate just a little higher than most? Or am I just too good at nose breathing and should I not trust this technique to determine if I'm wow. in zone two? Okay, there's quite a few things to add back in that mm. question. Uh, firstly, should we go for nose breathing? Nose breathing. Yeah, first? okay, let's start there. Nose breathing is possibly the worst definition of zone two that you can possibly do. Because yes, you can be very good at it. Uh, I know this is a bit of a rule of thumb from, I don't even know where this comes from. Yeah. But if you can breathe through your nose with your mouth closed, therefore you can't be working that hard and therefore you must be in zone two. That is not necessarily true. So firstly, throw that one away. You wear a heart rate monitor. Use your heart rate monitor. Um, is 180 beats per minute too high to be zone two? Um, there's no such thing as too high. I mean, all heart rates are different. Some people do have the heart rate of a hummingbird and they can actually get the heart rate really high and zone two could be 180 beats per minute. However, it does sound it seem very high, high yeah. for zone two. But then they do say they can run 90 minutes at 180 beats per minute. And if you can run 90 minutes at that intensity, I mean, it's not that far away from zone two because you wouldn't be able to run too much further yeah. um, than that uh, if it was I mean, my, my suggestion would be always in this case, if you're not too sure, go and do a fitness test, a lactate threshold fitness test or just a threshold fitness test, um, which you can do your own out on the road um, and recording your heart rate, your pace. Um, and we actually have a video on that on the channel, so go check that out. Um, yeah. But... I think the issue might be whatever you're recording this with because yeah. you're still going to come through with seemingly a high heart rate from this uh, threshold test. So I think you maybe need to check out whether you're are you using optical heart rate sensor on the wrist. If so, that often does read a little bit iffy. You want to probably be using a proper heart rate strap that's on your chest or on your arm. Um, and yep. make, sure make sure your heart rate is accurate. Make sure your heart rate zones are accurate. As Mark says, I mean, a lab lactate threshold test would be best but if you can't do that, you can simulate a lactate threshold test uh, out on the road, run 30 minutes as hard as you can, take the last 20 minutes, average heart rate. That is your lactate threshold heart rate. And then your zone two is 80 to 90, 80 to 92% of that, that average heart rate for the last 20 minutes of a 30 minute effort. And that is your zone two. And then you know what your zone two is. Unquestionably, it's not a like, oh, I was breathing through my nose, I must be in zone two. <sighs> you will know what it is and you can build your training from there around that. It may also be that you simply, as many of our previous askers have asked, uh, you can't, you're not really well trained in zone two. So your heart rate goes really high, really quickly as soon as you start running. In which case you maybe need to actually bring yourself all the way back down and start running much slower to get used to that zone two and that aerobic base. Um, yeah. Lots to unpack on that one, yeah. but uh, thanks for the question. Uh, next one, George Brown asks, hashtag GTN Coaches Corner. I started running around a year ago. A couple of months into my training program, I developed NTSS. That's shin splints for anyone who doesn't know what uh, medial tibial stress syndrome is. Uh, following a bad coaching advice, I tried to run through the pain, causing quite a lot of damage. Fast forward eight months and I'm now training for my first Olympic distance triathlon. Running volume has been increasing extremely slowly on a variety of surfaces, implementing deload weeks every five to six weeks and strength work for the calves, etc. 
but I'm still getting comfort between runs and struggling to build any significant volume. I've also had my gait and footwear checked by my local running shop and coach. With the current running boom, I'm sure I'm not the only person struggling with this. Will I ever be able to run pain-free? Yes. Yes, you will. <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, shin splints, or MTSS, uh, is a very frustrating problem, uh, but it can be solved. I know, I speak from personal experience. I used to Likewise. have really bad shin splints uh, when I was in my early 20s, and I really struggled with it for a long time. Um, we can't give medical advice here. We don't know your whole situation. We don't know what's going on. There are certain medical things that can cause this, such as compartment syndrome, uh, where simply the sheath around your muscle is just too tight and often there's very little you can do about that without lots of physiotherapy or even uh, an operation to fix it so that is possibly a, a, an answer or the answer if you've tried everything else and it does sound like you've tried a lot of a lot of things um for me I tried pretty much everything, icing the shins, stretching, all the different techniques that you're supposed to use and nothing seemed to work until, and this is a funny one, I became a triathlete and that solved my problems. Oh, just the strengthening up. Just getting on the bike yeah. and holding my, my shins in a certain position, strengthening the calves, getting that balance between the tibialis anterior and the, the, the gastrocnemius better was actually the solution for me because it turns out what I was probably doing was actually lifting my toes too much when I ran, the tibialis anterior mm. was getting strained and I wasn't really using my calves that much. The way I run is a bit more uh, heel based. So my calves were just not getting strained or they were big enough and strong enough that the tibialis anterior, the, the muscle on the front of my shin was getting overstrained and I just couldn't fix that until I got on a bike and suddenly it all came right and I never had bothered with it again. Uh, and so I'd say that if you've tried all those other things you have tried and it's still not uh, working, look a bit further afield. It could be your hips, it could be a hip balance, a, a glute imbalance, it could be even your feet. Um, there could be tightness in your feet that you need to work on. Um, it might not necessarily be in the shin. The symptom is in the shin, but the problem could be further afield. So make sure everything mm. is aligned and everything is as loose and flexible. Um, and then try some other therapies. And sometimes that might mean cross training. Cross training might be the solution. Um, but don't give up. Shin splints are not forever. My solution was uh, new shoes. I quite simply was new to the sport and I was running around in racing flats. I had no idea what the difference in racing flats and training <laughs> shoes was. So, uh, lo and behold, six months down the line, oh, I had rather sore shins. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, hard surface will do that. And putting, <laughs> putting, uh, putting racing flats on will certainly do that. So yeah, um, make sure your shoes are the right one. Right, so, a couple of questions now from, and these are the final questions from S1GM. 4LPH4. Right. Uh, why do my Alpha Watch, uh, Apple Watch Ultra and Garmin heart rate zones differ so much? And then they also go on to say, is being precisely in zone two all that important? I get a lot of mileage done at tempo slash threshold and a lot of walking mileage through hills slightly lower than zone two. What are the physiological adaptations, adaptations that can specifically occur in zone two? two uh well first off just with the apple and garmin uh question they're basically using different algorithms for those zones so they're not going to be quite as precise and as and exact so you will notice a difference when you're bouncing between the two different watches yeah as simple as that some of them use user input to data some of them use just guesstimated maximum heart rate etc so yeah make sure you're using the right zone um second question uh, is zone two precisely that important and what are the adaptations that occur? Well, um, precisely, no, it's not that precise. And this is actually a, a thing we get quite often because you put your zones, your, your heart rate into a zone calculator and it spits out this thing that says up until 155, you are in zone two and at 156, you are in zone three. And people think, wow, that between 155 and 156, some switch happens in my body <laughs> and everything changes about what it's doing. And that is not the case. Zones are not precise. They are very much on a continuum. You will shift slowly from zone two, gradually into zone three. The only difference being zone four, where you do go over a precipice where you're suddenly producing more lactic acid than you can uh, consume and you suddenly start building up lactic acid. That is your lactate threshold and that's pretty precise. That can be one, two, maybe three heart rate, heart rate beats difference uh, and you will know that you've changed zones. Everywhere else, the zone change is very much a gradual continuum. So no, zone two is not that precise. Uh, as far as what happens in zone two, uh, uh, that's a little bit more specific. Uh, in zone two, 
you are building your aerobic engine, you are straining it. If you're below zone two, zone one, you're not really straining it that much that you're gonna see that much adaptation. If you're above zone two, you're getting the same strain, your aerobic system is being strained. However, you're also straining everything else, which is why they recommend you don't go into zone three too often because your muscles, your joints, your ligaments, everything are taking a lot more impact uh, and you're gonna fatigue much quicker so you won't get as much work done. So therefore you should be training in zone two more than the other zones. Does yeah. that make sense? No, it definitely does. And it kind of to add to your first point around this kind of continual um, this spectrum with the heart rate, um, it, it, in reference also to the Apple Watches and the Garmin Watches, all the zones are slightly different. So you saying 155 to 156, I mean, it's different from each device you go on. So it really isn't that precise or accurate. So uh, uh, yeah. Just backing up what you're saying, really. Yeah, <laughs> I think yeah, I think you need to take it with a pinch of salt. Don't be too uh, much of a slave to your numbers. Your numbers are there to guide you and make sure that you're not doing anything crazy. They're not there to very strictly tell you one beat over and all lights are flashing and your watch is beeping and you are being sworn at by your watch saying uh, you need to stop now. Uh, just take them with a pinch of salt and use your zones smartly to train smartly rather than as a very strict taskmaster. Yeah, well, thanks ever so much for your questions. Keep them coming in using the hashtag GTN Coaches Corner. You can drop them below this video or any other video and we'll pick them up and we'll see you next time. See you again. Thanks for watching. Bye.